morning. Good morning. Am I on? Wait. Good morning. Am I on? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is this, yeah, is this a Verizon commercial? No. <laughs> well, good morning. I want to welcome you to Lakeshore Lutheran Fellowship on this uh, kind of frosty, chilly morning. But you know what? The warmth of God's presence is here in this place. And so it's good to see everyone on this day. And of those of you tuning in by live stream, we are delighted that you are joining us for worship. And you should have received a connection card when you came in. And if there's any way that we can pray for you or you would like to know more about us as a church family, we would love to connect with you. And uh, also, if this is your first time, uh, you can stop at the uh, Information Center afterwards. We have a gift we'd like to give you and also uh, introduce ourselves to you. You can get to know us as a church family. Also, um, something new this morning we're shifting our Sunday school class, and so we're going to have, we're kind of go, go back to the way we did it. So at the offering time, we're going to dismiss kids up to fourth grade. Is that right? Yes, thank you. And, uh, and then so during the offering, they can go, go to their Sunday school classes. And then after the service, we're still going to have an adult class as uh, we're in the study, Christ descent into hell. And what does that mean, that line in the creed? And any parents that want to stay, we will have um, child care for the kids during that class if you want to stay. So get ready. Sunday school uh, for the kids, the kids' connection, they'll be dismissed during the offering. So with that, let's stand as we prepare to worship. Just turn around as people feel comfortable and greet one another with the joy and peace of the Lord. Joy. So let us gather together as the Lord calls us into his presence this day, as we gather in the name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. And you know, it's a crazy, chaotic world out there. This is, this is an oasis, a refuge to come into the Lord's presence and to be strengthened, to be renewed. And the Lord calls us into his presence and to bring whatever baggage we're dragging around in our lives. Whatever the fears, whatever the anxieties, the worries, the troubles, the doubts, the unbelief, Jesus says, bring it to me. And I want us to do that. Whatever that baggage is that you're wrestling with, he invites us to give it to him this morning. So let us begin with this prayer of confession together. We confess. Gracious God, we acknowledge that we are sinners and we confess our sins. Those known to us that burden our hearts and those unknown to us but seen by you. We know that before you nothing remains hidden. And in you, everything is revealed. Free us from the slavery of sin. Liberate us from the bondage of guilt. Work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us take a few moments, if you'd bow your heads with me. And just to reflect on those words, as we, in just a few moments of Stillness and quietness just bring our sins, our burdens, our struggles to the Lord and confess those to him and ask for his mercy and grace. Let us take a few moments and do that right now.
Father, have mercy on us, we pray. Lord, hear the confession of our hearts as we cry out to you and ask for your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit to be at work this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, and maybe you're wrestling, wondering, what does God think of you? How do you stand with God? Does he love me? And I want to declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave his life, who died for you, who bore the sin of the whole world, that in his name, as you turn to him, you are forgiven. That you are set free. And that in Jesus, God the Father embraces you this day with his love, with his favor. He clothes you with the robe of Christ's righteousness. And he says, you are mine. You are my son. You are my daughter. Receive that this day. Receive the embrace of your heavenly Father through Jesus. You are loved. You are forgiven. Amen? And let us responsively speak these words of Psalm 32. How blessed is the person whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the person whose guilt the Lord does not charge against him, in whose spirit there is no deceit. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from distress. You will surround me with shouts of deliverance. Rejoice in the Lord and celebrate all you righteous and shout joyfully all you upright in heart. Let's do that. Let's celebrate and praise the name of the Lord. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is sure to hear this place. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. We sing to you. God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, but we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Let's get out, church. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. The house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord. 
out today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power Blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Sing it out, church. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. His amazing love for God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen. Between us, I'll 
high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows written Jesus Christ my living home who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the glory that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. God, you are our living hope in a world of darkness, in a world where there's so much despair and fear and uncertainty that you have broken through the darkness with your shining light in your only begotten Son, Jesus. Your word to us, your word come down, your word assuming our flesh and blood on himself that you came to set us free. 
that you came to us in our sin. You came to us in our misery. And that you bore it on Calvary's cross and bled and died. That we may be forgiven and set free. And because of your resurrection, because the tomb is empty, we have a living hope. And it is the light of that hope shining in our lives that gives us confidence and peace. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we walk through the darkness of this world, with all of its uncertainty and fears and anxieties, we pray that the light of your redeeming love would shine on us, would shine into our hearts and lives, that we may know the embrace of your love and that we may know that in you and in your love we have hope and that you will bring us through. We give all praise, glory, and honor to you, Jesus, that you are our living hope. You are our King and Lord. And you rule and reign as Son of the Father with the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Thanks be to God. And as we continue our worship, go ahead. So kids and parents, if you need to bring them back, Shannon's waiting at the door. Kids, you can go to your kids connection at this time. And um, yeah, we're going to start doing it this way once again. Because we realized we have to tweak things Try to do it all afterwards, doesn't work. So, all right. So while the hospitality team will be coming forward to take the the offering, um, if you're a guest, feel no obligation to give. We're just delighted that you have come and you're our guest. So don't give unless you feel like you want to. And uh, you can fill out that connection card. Um, We would love to get to know you, connect with you any way we can. And... uh, I have a couple of announcements while the offering is being taken. So our nursery is now open. The room will be staffed during service. As always, nursery will be open for parents um, to change diapers or have a place to nurse while still being able to listen to the sermon by the in-room speakers. We do need volunteers uh, to help accomplish this. And so if you could see Shannon or let the church office know or put that on your connection card, that would be great. And um, as you've already heard, but just to reinforce it, uh, Kids Connection uh, Kids Connection will be happening at this time uh, from this point forward. So um, preschool through fourth grade. And, uh, and we're getting ready for Easter. Well, it's like singing an Easter song this morning. That Living Hope song, isn't that awesome? I mean, and you know, every Sunday is like a mini Easter. So even if you're in Lent and talking about sin and repentance and all that, it's still a mini Easter. And so we sang this great Easter song this morning. But we're getting ready for Easter, and that includes our Easter egg hunt. And, uh, oh, wait, don't, yeah, there we go. Yeah, that includes our Easter egg hunt. We need volunteers. So this will be Saturday, April 16th. This is always a great outreach to the community from 8 to 11. If you can help us with that, because we always get all these kids And um, we're going to have a little gospel message for them before it's like, before they go out and get their eggs. So at that point, they're gone. (laughs) You got to get them first. (laughs) Also, Easter Lily order forms are now available in the atrium. Orders are due by April 3rd. That's next Sunday. And uh, as we will beautify our sanctuary with Easter lilies for Easter. And uh, with that, let's prepare our hearts to hear God's word. If you'd have a word of prayer with me, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your life-giving word that is the truth in a world where there are so many uncertainties and lies, and uh, Lord, that, that we can hear from you. So Lord, let us hear you speak to us, first through the scriptures. Give us attentive ears and hearts. In your name we pray, amen. And on this fourth Sunday in Lent, the theme is how God saves us and the joy and the freedom that there is in his love that saves us. 
And uh, first of all, this marvelous text from Isaiah chapter 12, the prophet speaking to Israel. It says, in that day you will say, I will give thanks to you, Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust him and will not be afraid because Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. And he has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Declare among the peoples what he has done. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done amazing things. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, daughter of Zion. For the Holy One of Israel is great among you. The word of the Lord. And then from Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 8, another magnificent text, how we are set free in Christ by the Spirit. So then, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Indeed, what the law was unable to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did when he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. God condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous decree of the law would be fully satisfied in us who are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. To be sure, those who are in harmony with the sinful flesh think about things the way the sinful flesh does. And those in harmony with the Spirit think about things the way the Spirit does. Now the way the sinful flesh thinks results in death. But the way the Spirit thinks results in life and peace. For the mindset of the sinful flesh is hostile to God, since it does not submit to God's law, and in fact it cannot. Those who are in the sinful flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the sinful flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed God's spirit lives in you. And if someone does not have the spirit of Christ, that person does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. The word of the Lord. And finally, Luke 15. Probably one of the, we got a whole bunch of great texts this morning. Probably one of the most marvelous gospel parables in the whole New Testament. And Jesus told it all because he hung around sinful people. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to hear him. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable. Jesus said a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and traveled to a distant country. There he wasted his wealth with reckless living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. He went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He would have liked to fill his stomach with the carob pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, and I'm dying from hunger? I will get up. Go to my father and tell him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He got up and went to his father. And while he was still far away, 
his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, hugged his son, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Then they began to celebrate. His older son was in the field. And as he approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. And the servant told him, your brother is here. Your father killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And the older brother was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. He answered his father, look, these many years I've been serving you and I never disobeyed your command, but you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours arrived after wasting your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the gospel, the good news of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I ask, oh, just open our hearts to receive all that you have for us this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Pastor, I'm just not worthy. I've, my sin is too bad. God could not love me. I heard those words about 18, 19 years ago. I call him Ken. Ken was a member of Atonement Lutheran Church in Omaha, Nebraska. And a uh, rough guy. You could just tell by his appearance. He'd had a hard life. He had had uh, a drug addiction that he wrestled with. And then, I don't know how it happened. I don't know what exactly happened. He ended up abusing his 12-year-old daughter. It's just horrible. And he confessed. He was convicted. He was in the Douglas County Jail before he got transferred to more maximum security place. I got to visit him twice. He was just devastated. Just devastated. How could I do that? How could I do that? And like, there's no way God could love me. I am unworthy. I don't deserve his love. And all I could do with, with Ken is just say, you know what? Yeah, you're a sinner. So am I. We're all broken sinners. And, you know, try to share with him the redeeming love of God and Jesus. But he was just not ready for it. It's like, no, he can't love me. I've gone too far. My, my, this is too awful. This is too evil. His heart wasn't ready to receive it. You know, in um, almost 23 years of ministry, I've heard pretty much everything. Sometimes people come and say, oh, I'm almost embarrassed to share this with you. And it's like, don't be. I've heard it all. <laughs> pretty much just about everything. And uh, of everything that people will come to me to discuss and talk about or, or need counseling, th this is one of the great, greatest things I hear, that I hear most often. I don't deserve his love. What I did is, is, is too awful, too bad. It's like I committed that one sin too many that goes beyond the limit, and now he can't love me. He can't redeem me. 
And, and I've heard that so many times. I, I just don't deserve it. I'm not worthy of it. But you know, that the other side of that coin that I also hear a lot is, you know, I have to be a better Christian. You know, I know I need to be in church. Or no, oh, I know I need to be praying more. I know I need to be a better Christian in order for him to love me. And it's that thought of, I need to deserve his love. I need to be deserving, and so I need to do better. I, I need to pray harder. I need to be better. I need to serve people more. And those are two sides of the same coin. I hear that more than anything else. And here's the thing. It's right. We're not worthy. We don't, in and of ourselves, we're not worthy of his love. We don't deserve it. And yet he loves us anyways. He loves us anyways. Because it doesn't depend on our worthiness or whether we deserve it or not. Because we don't. And yet he loves us anyways. This is the extravagance of God's love. You know, if you look up that word extravagance in the dictionary, the one I think Merriam-Webster I went to, it had three, three definitions. One was uh, lacking restraint in spending money or using resources. The second is uh, something costing too much. And the third is exceeding what is reasonable or appropriate to the point of being absurd. And when I looked it up, I thought, you know what? God's extravagant love in is like all three. He, he does not hold back. That he gives his all. It costs him himself. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, you could say, well, that's too much. Why would the creator of the universe give himself to the point of death to have us? Exceeds all that we would think reasonable or appropriate to the point of being absurd. That even the gospel message itself, people are like, well, this is foolishness. What kind of God would come and die? But this is the extravagant love of God for you and me. And you know what? We all wrestle to one degree or another with feelings of being unworthy, of not deserving his love. And, and then thinking, and we're beyond his love. Or thinking there's something we have to do to deserve it. Well, this parable is for you and me. Because Jesus hangs out with sinners. You know, in Luke 15, we get three parables, but we're going to focus on the third one. Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. They're coming to him. There's something about Jesus that draws these people to him because he's showing them the favor and the acceptance and the love of the Heavenly Father, and they're just drawn to him, and they're eating with him, even though they may think they don't deserve the love of God. But now you got the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the experts in the law, who are trying to be more deserving of God's love than anyone else. And they're pointing a finger going, wait a minute, what are you doing? Eating with unworthy people. What are you doing eating with scum of the earth like these tax collectors and sinners? And so Jesus says, okay, I have three stories for you. He tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the story of the two sons. But it really could be called the story of the father's extravagant love. So Jesus says, I want you to picture a man who had two sons. And the younger son said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Oh, wait a minute. Even today, that wouldn't happen. You wouldn't say to your parents, hey, look, can I like have my inheritance right now? You're like, what are you talking about? They'd say, well, that's odd. No, no that's, that's when I die. Back then, I mean, that was the height of ethical, I mean, 
ethical breach, the greatest insult imaginable. You don't do that. There's no stories in the ancient Near East of a son coming to his father and saying, can I have your estate? You know, I want my share of the inheritance, and I want it right now. You know what? You might as well just be dead. I don't want you in my life anymore. I want what's coming to me now, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And you see, it would be the older son. It would be the firstborn who would be the trustee of the estate. It was the firstborn who also would get three-fourths of the inheritance, and then that last quarter would go to the rest of the sons, and in this case, to the younger son. And yet here he is, he's like, no, I want it now. You might as well be dead. And the shock, I mean, the hearers at this point are like, whoa, that's all oh, that despicable, miserable, rotten son. He deserves to be punished. He deserves to be disowned, disinherited. In fact, that's what would have happened. Disinherit him. You're no longer my son. How dare you wish me dead like this? You're no longer part of my inheritance. You know, this is a picture of our sin. God, just give me what I got coming to me, but I don't want you in the picture. I want my life and my blessings, and I want to live it my way for my happiness, but you know what? You might as well be dead, God, because I don't want you in my life. And the father has every right to disinherit his son and say, no, you should be beaten, you should be disinherited, you're no longer my son. What does the father do? To the shock of everyone that's listening. So he divided the property between them. <gasps> Why would he do that? This is the first instance of the extravagant love of the father. This is like absurd. This is like why would you do this while you're still alive? He did. Because of his love for his son. He says, okay. So the older son got his portion. The younger son got his portion. This is what God does. The creator of the universe who made us, who created us, who gives us life and breath and all that we are and have, even though he knew that we would sin. Even though he knew that we would turn our backs on him. Even though he knew, you know, that we would rebel. He still lavishly gives us life. That's the extravagance of his love. And not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had. Which, which meant he had to take the estate and put it in liquid money form that he could spend which would be really hard because all the neighbors would be another shock. The whole community would be like, no way, we ain't dealing, doing business with you. You're a despicable, shameful son, and you should, be, you should be punished, you should be disinherited. So he had to find some unscrupulous investor or businessman whom he could exchange the estate, his portion, for gold coins, money, liquid form, so he could take it with him and spend money gather it together, and he traveled to a distant country because he's the pariah, the shame of the whole community. And everyone's going to be pointing fingers and looking down on him. You're the one who wished your father dead. And he's getting out of Dodge. He's going to a distant country where he doesn't have to be near his father, doesn't have to be near the community at all. He can live life the way he wants to. Doesn't have to follow the rules or strictures of his father or his household he can do it his way, his money, pursue his own happiness, fill his heart the way he wants to fill it. And this is a picture of our sin, our rebellion. Taking what God gives us and saying, God, I don't need you. I don't need your advice. I don't need your presence. I don't need you in my life. Thank you for my life. I'll do with it as I please. And then we squander it. So the younger son, he went to that distant country and wasted his wealth with reckless living. 
Now, it doesn't say what that reckless living is, but you can just fill in the blanks and imagine. He's spending money all over the place, just living up for his own happiness and pleasure. And, and this is our sinful nature, that you're squandering what God has given us for our own health, our own happiness, our own pleasure, for our own sake, and pushing him out of the picture. And God allows it. The Father in love gave it to him and is allowing him to take it and waste it. Of course, then you get to the point where you spend it all and you realize it doesn't satisfy. So after the younger son had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country and he began to be in need. He spent it all. It's all gone. He used up his bank account. And now there's a famine. Food is scarce. Inflation. Price is going up. And now he's in need. Nothing will satisfy his need. And God allows us to get to this point. When we try to live life without him. When we squander his good creation. When we squander our lives. Everything he's blessed us with. Everything he's given us. And we squander it for our own happiness. Apart from him. Apart from his glory. He lets us get to a point of need. Where we're famished. And spiritually, there's a hole inside of us that nothing can fill, nothing can satisfy. We got this aching need for satisfaction. We're looking for significance in life, and there's no security anywhere that we can find. He brings us to this point of need to wake us up to the, the truth that we cannot live life apart from him. You know, and it's at that point that people get desperate. You know, that desperation may be, you know, turning to alcohol and drugs. Or being a workaholic, trying to anesthetize the pain. And so, in his desperation, it's like, okay, well, I, I just gotta, I gotta make do. And he went out and hired himself to one of the citizens of that country. So, a Gentile pig farmer, a Jew who doesn't associate with Gentiles and pigs, no less. Sorry, they couldn't eat bacon or ham. They were unclean. He, he is reduced to the lowest shameful place imaginable. And in his desperation, this is what he does just to get by. And he's still not satisfied. He's still hungry. And interesting, the text says he would have liked to fill his stomach with the carob pods that the pigs were eating. And for a human they're not nutritious at all. And yet, in a time of famine or extreme poverty, people would eat a carob pod. So he's reduced to absolute poverty and eating the most unnourishing food or desiring it because he says no one would give him anything. God reduces us to a place of ground zero. To realize our poverty before him. Our need. And for some, they have to be brought lower than others. But this is the beginning of repentance. Where, where God in his extravagant love, he gives us all good gifts and he allows us to waste them. He allows us to squander them. So that then in the consequences of our own rebellion, we can wake up to the fact that none of what we have on our own will satisfy And he begins to have a change of heart and mind. When he came to his senses, you would think of this, it's like, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Wait a minute. My father, wealthy landowner, has all these hired servants who get paid as servants, and they get fed better than I am right now, and I used to be a son. What am I doing here, dying of hunger? This, isn't, this ain't working. He begins to have a change of heart and mind. Repentance begins to take place. And he's like, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to acknowledge that I've sinned against heaven. And that's a, 
kind of a polite Jewish way. They wouldn't always want to use God's name. It's called a circumlocution. Heaven, that means God. I've sinned against heaven, against God. And in your sight, Father, he's already rehearsing his speech. He's like, okay, I've sinned. I've blown it. I've wasted it. I've been rebellious. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I don't deserve to be your son. But make me like one of your hired servants. Oh, wait a minute. He's begun to have a change of heart and mind. He, he, he knows and he feels that he's not worthy. He's sinned. He's done what's wrong. But he still has to deserve his father's favor. He's like, you know what? I'll work for you. Make me one of your hired servants. In this way, he can save face. And he can be in the household He can be a hired servant, making money. He can try and pay back the debt he owes his father. He doesn't have to live with his his brother on his estate. And he can hopefully get back in the good graces of his father. And we can often think like this. It's like, okay, God, what do I have to do to make things right? So the beginning of repentance has happened. He knows he's a sinner. He knows he's not worthy to be a son. And yet he's wondering, what can I do to deserve his favor? Well, this is all shattered when the father comes to him and comes to him right where he's at. I love this. So the son got up and went to his father. And while he was still far away, his father saw him. Wait a minute, he saw him. Has he been waiting for him? This implies the father is waiting for his son. He's looking for his son. I mean, I can imagine maybe in the morning he goes out and he looks out in the field. I'm waiting for my son. And maybe at noontime he goes out and he looks into the field. I want my son back. And maybe in the evening he goes out and he looks into the field. I want my son back. And one day, day after day after day of looking and waiting and longing, he sees his son in the distance. And the father saw him and was filled with compassion. The Greek word is great, splonk nidzumai. That's a mouthful. And it, it, it's a visceral emotion. It, it, it's like the tearing up of your guts. It's like, it it gets you on the inside. It so moves you. You know, it breaks your heart. It's like, that's my son. And he runs. He ran to him. He ran to hug his son. Now I'm going to go, yeah, why wouldn't he? But you didn't do this. Noble men didn't run in public, in case you didn't know. In fact, this even goes back to Aristotle who said, It's a shame for a nobleman to run in public. And Jews, they had their own proverbs and wisdoms about wisdom about it, that a nobleman, a wealthy, upstanding Jewish landowner, will not run in public. And especially when he's got his robe on, that would be shameful. He does it anyway. He pulls up the skirt of his robe and forget the shame of it. He runs to his son. To embrace him, to hug him, to squeeze him, to embrace him in love, to have him back. And this is a beautiful picture of what our God has done. That he sees us in our sin, in our rebellion. And he runs to us to embrace us. He comes to right where we're at, which is who Jesus is, the very word of the Father's love, who came in our flesh and blood and has come to us in our sin to bear the shame on himself because the father would have to bear the debt of his son's wastefulness to have him back. And so that God the Father runs to us in Jesus in our human flesh and blood. He humbles and humiliates himself dying the most shameful death on the cross to bear our shame, to bear our debt and pay for it with his shed blood. There he embraces you and me. 
he wraps his arms around us and says, you're forgiven. The debt has been paid. There's nothing you need to do. This is a picture of the Father's heart in Jesus. That his heart breaks over us and he runs to us in Jesus to grab a hold of us, to embrace us and say, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you are my son, you are my daughter. And notice the son's heart just melts. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's it. Because the Father has already loved him. The Father has already embraced him. And he just acknowledges, I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy of it. But you've loved me anyways. And so he does you and me. And he lavishes all of his gifts, the gifts of heaven on us. He... He gives us our identity as sons and daughters of God. The father said to his servants, quick, bring out the best robe, put on him. This would be the father's robe that he's putting on his son. Putting the signet ring, the ring of authority that has the family name on it. And sandals on his feet. Get the fattened calf. Let's celebrate. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate and be glad because you've been found. You're alive again. God the Father does this for us. He says, I clothe you in the robe of Christ's righteousness. I put my name on you in the waters of holy baptism. I declare that you are mine. You are a royal son and daughter of the heavenly Father. You are embraced and you are brought into his house where there is joy, where there is celebration, where there is peace, and where there is a feast at his table, a foretaste of the heavenly feast to come. And we were lost, but now we are found. We were dead, but now we are alive. And faith just receives it. But we can still struggle with things. Oh, but wait a minute. Maybe I have to do better. Oh, maybe I've got to be a better Christian. I've got to be deserving of this love. And here's the older son. He's out in the field. He approaches the house, he hears the music and the dancing. Now, there's an absurdity factor to this parable because people are like, wait a minute, this wouldn't happen. The son would be the host of the party. He would be responsible as the oldest son to help reconcile the father and the younger son, his brother. But this speaks to his detachment from his father. He's like, oh, what's going on? There's a party because your brother is back. And you've killed the fattened calf, and your dad has received him back safe and sound. And here, the older brother, he's angry. No, I ain't going to that party. And his father comes out and begins to plead with him Come in, my son. Now, here's what we don't get in this story the older son has insulted his father on a level that's equivalent to the younger son. We don't see it because we don't live in an honor, shame culture like they did. So there's one commentator that points to seven ways the older son insulted his father. I mean, first of all, he's making a public scene. He's refusing to do his duty as the older son. He's refusing to come into the party. He refuses to honorably address his father with a title You don't just speak to your father without a title at that point in time. He slanders his father and accuses him of doing wrong while also slandering his brother. So notice this. He answers his father, look, these many years I've been serving you and I've never disobeyed and you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. That right there is an insult to the honor of the father. For a son to speak like that in public and bring, you know, treat his father shamefully in public. The whole community is gathered because the father wants them, the community, to know my son is back. And then the slander his brother. Oh, yeah, he's wasted your property with prostitutes. He doesn't know that. Maybe he did. The text doesn't say he didn't. How would the brother know? You killed the fattened calf for him. 
but you never did anything for me. And here's the third instant of the extravagant love of the father. Once again, he could have disinherited his son. How could you be my son? How could you speak to me like this? You're a shame. You're a disgrace. The father, you're my son. Son, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad because this, your brother of yours who was dead, is alive again. He was lost and he's found. He appeals to him. Even though he's not worthy, the father says, come to the party. And you see, whichever side we're on, the father opens his arms to us today and says, receive the love of the father. Jesus has received the father's love. There's no sin that you've done that is so bad that you cannot be loved by him. And there's nothing you can do to deserve or earn his love. We are all unworthy and undeserving, and yet he loves us anyways in Christ by running to us, by embracing us, by forgiving us. So there is nothing you can do that will make him love you less. And there's nothing you can do that would make him love you more. That's the extravagant love of the Father. And how deep his love is for you and me. And there's some of us here in this morning. You haven't ever fully received that. And he's calling you to just open up your heart and faith and say, Father, I need your love. I want to close with good modern day story that illustrates this. This was in an NPR article. A San Diego father named Frank who believed his son, a homeless heroin addict living on the streets in Denver, believed he was on the verge of dying. And so Frank contacted Chris Connor, one of Denver's leading homeless advocates. Connor has helped parents find their lost children, but this was different. Connor said, I've never had a parent who necessarily went this far to, quote from the article, descend into homelessness themselves. Connor connected with Frank, connected Frank with Pastor Jerry Herships, whose church serves lunch to homeless people in a Denver park across from the state capitol. And Frank described the moment he met his son on the street in Denver. He has no idea that I'm walking towards him. I can see that he can't stand up without the support of a building. He would appear drunk to most people. To his dad, though, I know from past experience, sadly, he's on heroin. Heavy. I go up to him, and he starts to turn his back on me. I don't even care. I just grab him and squeeze him as hard as I can. For a week, Frank became his son's shadow, wandering the streets during the day and sleeping on the banks of a river at night. He grew a beard, ate handout sandwiches during the day, and swatted away the rats at night. Meanwhile, his son got sick in and out of the hospital, stealing to buy more drugs. And at one point, Frank told his son, if you die, your mom and dad die with you. We might still be here breathing, but make no mistake, we'll be dead inside. And eventually, the son was rescued. But he was asked, why did he go to those lengths. And Frank said, the only thing I could think of was just go there, be with him, and love him, and show him how much his family loves him. That's how much God loves you. He comes to where you're at. He embraces you and me, no matter how unworthy or undeserving. Receive that extravagant love of the Father. Amen? Please stand. Oh. Oh, Heavenly Father. Though we can think of a thousand ways we are not worthy, that we don't deserve your love or grace, 
yet you love us. You came to us in your son Jesus. And by your spirit, you come to us right now. In this word of gospel, this good news. And I pray for anyone here in this place whose heart is broken by hurts and shame or guilt. Whatever walls might have been built up that, Father, you would just melt their hearts. And that they would receive the embrace of your redeeming love. To know your favor. To know your acceptance. To know your approval. That does not depend upon anything we do. But depends upon you. And the giving of your son. And that your Holy Spirit would pour that love into our hearts as we come to that realization of our sin, of our need, of our unworthiness. But how worthy you are because you and your extravagance that you have given your love in Jesus and you pour it out by your Spirit. Let us receive that. Heal our hearts. Transform our lives. And let us as your church Be a shining light that the world may see your favor, your love, your acceptance in us, among us, and that you would draw people to yourself through us. That the gospel may go forth. And Lord, we pray for your church that may be a beacon of light in this dark world. And Lord, we pray with all your people around the world. We pray for our world. We pray for peace. We pray for warfare in the Ukraine to end. We pray, Lord, for the refugees, Lord, to be provided for, to be provided homes, give them safety. Lord, we pray for all evil and tyranny to be restrained and brought to an end. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would use us as your people to advance your kingdom of your heavenly goodness and love and faithfulness and truth, that lives may be changed, that people may come, that the the chains may break off and they may be set free from addiction and hurt and pain, that they may be healed and saved and set free and that the hopeless may have hope and the grieving may have comfort and that you would be our joy and our strength. And Lord, in our midst, we just bring all of our cares, all of our needs to you as we lift up the needs for healing and body. Lord, as we continue to pray for, we pray for Jim Albright, having had surgery, Joel Elam, Jamie Pendle Westcomb, who is in hospice. Lord, we, we lift her up. Lord, just we pray for a healing miracle. Kurt Pendell, we lift up our brother Cliff. Oh, Lord, that you would just put your healing hand on him. Be with him and Connie both. Craig Schultz as he recovers from surgery. Lord, these and others here in our midst, those that we know, those struggling with grief or pain or hardship, Lord, that you would make your presence and peace known to each at their point of need. And oh Lord, let us know that you have brought us into your house. There's joy in your presence and that we have a living hope of the life to come as we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sing grace, 
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. extravagant love of your heavenly Father and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit fill you with his love that you would live in the embrace of your Father safe and secure through all trials and troubles to life everlasting and all God's people said Amen. You're a Jesus looking people. Let that love radiate from you love on one another. Have a great week. If you're new, please stop at our information center. And uh, in about 10 minutes, we will be having our uh, adult Bible class. You can stay for that. Otherwise, have a blessed week and live in the embrace of the Father's love.